Welcome back, delegates. Now we're going to have a panel discussion and a discussion on case scenarios on urogenic low urinary tract uh, symptoms. Uh, I would like to call upon Dr. Anand Kumar, Dr. Sanjay Sinha, Dr. Nitin Kekre, Dr. Joseph Thomas, and Dr. Nagraj S. to be our panelists for the session. And I would like to call Professor Paul Abrahams to moderate the session. Thank you very much. So um, I've got a few cases and uh, Professor Sinha also has a case. So we're going to have some interesting discussion. So of course there are some traditional things in neurourology. There are some traditional things and, and you're, you've all probably seen a cystogram like this. Bladder being filled with a catheter. An IVP like this with the classical fir tree bladder, Christmas tree bladder, where you have trabeculation and you have sacculation. And of course, trabeculation and sacculation are due to detrusa overactivity. So the bladder is contracting against a fixed volume the bladder is contracting against a fixed volume and some bits of muscle are able to shorten slightly. And obviously if it's a fixed volume of urine, if some parts of the bladder can shorten and there's no leakage, then they have to develop out pouches to absorb the volume that's been reduced by the parts of the bladder that can contract. So when you look in a trabeculated bladder, the strands you see are the strands of bladder muscle that do shorten. And between them, the sacculations are bits of the bladder which are having to expand to accommodate the urine that's being pushed out by the contracting parts of the bladder. And as that progresses, of, co of course, you can sometimes go to uh, diverticular. So that's trabeculation and sacculation. And quite why, I, I never really quite knew why it was a fir tree shape. Do we know? Can anybody make up a good Christmassy story about this? No, okay, right. So um, I'm going to show you a lady uh, with multiple sclerosis. I appreciate that you very rarely see multiple sclerosis, but it's quite interesting because uh, these patients, and obviously it can affect women and men, can have some of the same problems as other neurological patients. So this lady has quite a long history, and of course we think of overactive bladder as being a condition suffered by non-neurological patients. But remember, the vast majority of neurological patients do have bladder sensation. So stroke patients can feel urgency. Parkinson's patients can feel urgency. MS patients can feel urgency. Dementia patients can feel urgency if they can express themselves. So actually, overactive bladder symptoms can be felt by neurological patients. And only a minority of neurological patients have no sensation. The classic one, of course, being the spinal cord injury patients. So this woman had over long-standing overactive bladder symptoms, but she also had difficulty voiding with an interrupted stream. Her MS was reasonably stable, and she was still mobile. So we did urodynamics on her. And so uh, red for rectum. So here's the voiding. There's no straining. No straining during voiding. Um, there's a sort of funny cough there. Those are equal, so that's good quality. Um, here's the bladder pressure. Well, you see, although there's no straining, it almost looks as if there should be straining because the bladder pressure is going up and down. Now, if we look at the urine flow, bladder detrusor pressure starts going up here, and at this point, flow starts, and you can see that the pressure falls a little bit. Flow continues, and at this point, pressure goes up, and at this point, flow goes down. If we look further on, here we have flow, and we have low pressure. At this point, flow stops, 
and the pressure goes up and the flow goes down. At this point, sorry, at that point, flow restarts, the pressure goes down and the flow goes up. So that is, my friends from yesterday, what is that? Detrusor sphincter dysinergia. So MS is one of the few conditions where you can get detrusor sphincter dysinergia. And the fascinating thing about it is that it never causes upper track problems. Or well, I've never seen it. And we see a lot of MS. So I don't know why that is. Because in female spinal cord injury, you see upper track problems with detrusor sphincter dysinergia. But in these patients, we don't seem to see it. So this is detrusor sphincter dysinergia, where pressure and flow are going in opposite directions. Now, we see lots of patients with interrupted flows, but many of them have flows which are interrupted for other reasons. Now, in classical spinal cord injury and in some of these MS patients, the detrusor sphincter dysinergia is due to a problem with the pontine micturition center. So normally, the pontine micturition center ensures the reciprocal activity of the bladder and the urethra. In other words, when the patient wants to void, the pontine micturition center makes sure that the urethra relaxes and that the bladder contracts. And when the pontine micturition center doesn't work, if there is a lesion between the brain stem and the sacral micturition center, then you may lose that coordination so that the bladder contracts and the urethra contracts at the same time. So usually what happens, classically, is what I showed you, is that you have a bladder contraction and then suddenly the urethra contracts and the urine flow stops. The bladder, of course, continues to contract then the urethra relaxes, as we saw uh, in the picture. So you have this opposite movement of pressure and flow, and that's diagnostic of urethral overactivity, characteristic of, as we'll see, uh, detrusor sphincter dysinergia and other conditions which we'll be talking about tomorrow. The risks are, of course, that you take ages to empty your bladder because the flow keeps being stopped. So your bladder's working really hard for a long time to try and empty itself. So therefore you get detrusor hyper hypertrophy, you get a thick wall bladder, and then you lose the detrusor's ability to unfurl as the bladder fills without raised pressure. So you have raised intravesical pressure. And of course, there are two very good reasons why you can't have that and survive. Well, one is why you can't survive. If you have high pressure in the bladder, the kidneys cannot empty into the bladder. And we all know why that is, because the ureter is a pathetic, skinny little thing. The ureteric muscle is never sufficient to be able to hypertrophy and propel urine down. And anyway, even if it did, you still can't have high pressures in the kidney, otherwise you don't have the differential filtration pressure that we all need in order to rid our body of waste products. So you have to have low bladder pressure, which is why this condition is so dangerous. And so in spinal cord injury, up to the Second World War, the prognosis of somebody who got a spinal cord injury was death within two years. If you made five years, you were very lucky. And that was entirely due, well, not, well I suppose entirely due to detrusor sphincter dysinergia. And then about 1942, the death rate fell. Why was that? Well, some people say, well, that was because of antibiotics. But actually, antibiotics were not widely available in 1942. It fell because this very clever man came to England, called Sir Ludwig Gutmann. He came to England only because he was Jewish and he was fleeing from the Nazis. But somebody knew that he was a very clever neurologist and they appointed him to this hospital outside London called Stoke Mandeville Hospital, 
where they were establishing, they wanted to establish a spinal cord injury unit to help all the soldiers that were coming back during the Second World War with spinal cord injuries. And he had some experience with catheterizing, using intermittent catheterization from the 1930s when he'd worked in a neurological hospital in Germany. So he introduced, as you said, where's he gone? Rajiv. Um, as you heard last, he, he introduced uh, intermittent aseptic catheterization. And this transformed the patients. The patients all lived, because all he was doing was ensuring that four times a day the patient emptied their, emptied their bladder fully. So that got rid of the raised pressures. It meant that the bladder emptied fully four times a day. The infections went away because in the 30s they all died. Basically, they got an infection. Then they got pyelonephritis, stone formation, and septicemia. That's why they all died so quickly, a mixture of sepsis and renal failure. And then suddenly, from this simple maneuver, uh, the patients all had a normal life expectancy, as they do now. So we, what's slightly mysterious about uh, detrusor sphincter dyssynergia is, although it can occur from any lesion between the sacral micturition center and uh, the pontine micturition center, it's commoner with the higher lesions. So here we've got the situation with straining, and I said that we see lots of patients who have interrupted flow, but most of them have detrusor underactivity. So you see they have a poor bladder contraction or they have no bladder contraction and they're relying on straining. And then when pressure and flow go together, that's detrusor underactivity or an acontractile bladder. And you can see there pressure and flow go together. But when pressure and flow are in opposite directions, as they are here, increase in flow and a fall in pressure. When they're in opposite directions, that's urethral overactivity. So that's the way we diagnose detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. So I'll show you, a, this time, a, a spina bifida man. Um, he had his meningomyelis seal closed soon after birth. He had some involuntary urine loss through his young years uh, and came to us wearing pads. He had urinary infections, some bowel problems, remembering these patients more or less all have bowel problems as well. So as a urologist looking after these patients, I guess you find you end up looking after their bowels as well because there's nobody else to do it. So it's not too complicated and it's very sensible. He is still mobile and um, as with the spinal cord injury patients, the EAU would say, yes, you should do uh, a baseline urodynamics when you come across this patient. So he was a new patient to us, so we did um, urodynamics. So you can see his urodynamics here. He's got a decent bladder capacity. It's o over five, he's gone up, to, well that's 600 there, so it's over 600. And you can see that's, um, that's his bladder, that's his abdominal pressure, and this is his detrusor pressure. It's a good quality trace, the coughs are equal. And you can see that he's showing evidence of poor compliance. Does he have detrusor overactivity? Anybody think he's got detrusor overactivity? I can see people shaking their heads. Well, we just have to think about the presentation of urodynamics. Is this what you want to see? Not quite. It's good quality, but it's too truncated. Remember, this is going from one minute to 32 minutes. So you're seeing 32 minutes of bladder filling. And of course, that changes the appearance. If you spread it out, it really looks quite different. So if we just look at that, this is the beginning of filling. It's the same patient, same investigation, we're just presenting it differently. So you can see good quality trace, um, bladder, rectum, and detrusor. And you can see there is already, at a volume of about 200, there's already a small change in the detrusor pressure. Now as we go up from about 200 to about 400, you can see that, well, look, there is actually detrusor overactivity. 
These aren't very big waves, that's the biggest one so far. And interestingly, in him, it's cough-induced, isn't it? You see, <coughs> you see a cough here, small wave, cough here, small wave. See here better, on the bladder. Cough, contraction, cough, contraction. So for some reason or other, the increase in intra-abdominal pressure fires off atetrusor contraction. Now you shouldn't be too surprised because one of the ways these patients void is they do tapping, don't they? They tap their lower abdomen and that induces a contraction. And they're often able to void quite efficiently by that manner. So coughing uh, does it to some degree. So you can see it does look quite different. It's quite clear now while we've spread this out that this patient actually has detrusor overactivity as well as a change in baseline pressure. So he has poor compliance with superimposed detrusor overactivity. So I would suggest that when you do your urodynamics, the filling phase does need to be, we would say, at least a maximum of 10 minutes per uh, field. Yeah, you know what I mean anyway. Per page, 10 minutes per page maximum. If you squash it up, you're going to miss things. I'll just show you this while I think about it. So most of these patients have an obstruction at sphincter level, which is there. And you can see there an interesting shape. Looks just like the prostate. That's because it is the prostate. And what is happening here is that the contrast medium is being forced into the prostatic ducts. Now, if I did this test on you, that wouldn't happen. Because your point of continence will be the bladder neck. And this is because you've got raised intravesical pressure and that it goes right down to sphincter level. So you see this blush. And that's indicative of sphincter obstruction, if, there, if you ever see that. So he has an unsafe lower motor neuron lesion. Partial, of course, he's a spina, he's a spina bifida patient. You know it's par partial because he's getting some detrusive contraction. Therefore, he's got, some, he's got some sacral reflex arc. He has poor compliance and poor bladder emptying. So, panel, how are we going to manage, how would you manage this, this gentleman? I think the first line will be to start on an anticholinergic because high pressures are there, but that will produce an increase in residual urine, which is a secondary problem which also has to be tackled. Same time, outlet also is a problem, but for DSD, we don't have much medications now. Okay, I think that what I should have given you is the fact that he, although he's got this poor compliance, he has normal upper tracts on ultrasound because that's the first thing. Remembering again, I haven't given you the... Well, we can work out... Let's go back one. We can work out the... What we talked about... What we talked about yesterday was what you do if you see this. So this is... Um, he's, this, I said this is 30 minutes. He's got 600 mLs in. 30 into 600 mLs is a, a filling rate of 20. Well, that's not bad. It's not a bad starting point for a neurological patient, but what they should have done is they sh as soon as they saw this pressure change, they should have slowed it down. They should have stopped first and seen what happened to the pressure. If the pressure falls when you stop, so if you stop here and the pressure comes down, then you know you're filling too fast and then you should restart your filling slower. So sorry, I'm rambling on as I think about things. If I don't say it, I'll forget it. So. Um, so as it happens, his, his uh, ultrasound is okay. So we're not, at the moment, worried about his upper tract. So you suggested we put him on to anticholinergics. Now, I think we've got a relative hole in our evidence base because I, I worry about anticholinergics in low compliance because I'm not convinced about how effective they can be. Well, what do you feel about that? Do they always work to bring the pressure down, do you think? Or work well enough? I don't know. I don't know that part, I think. 
So they do work, but they don't work in and all I, patients. You have to say, is this expert opinion or is this fact? Oh. You see, he says they do work. Well, they, what does he know? You know, he saw a patient last week and it worked really well. He forgot the previous five patients in who it hadn't worked at all. No, so, so I'm making fun of all of us because we make these, these experts like us, we make these pronouncements. But, you know, you should always, the young ones, research comes from you saying, he said, is that really true? And then you go back and you look up the last 10 patients that you treated with an anticholinergic, and lo, you find, actually, it doesn't bring the pressure down at all, or whatever. That's the way research starts, by questioning the alleged experts. So I expect you all to question me, and we all expect that you will question each of us. But he's always right, so I'm not really, I'm joking, really. Um, so it, it doesn't work in all patients, and patients who have unsafe storage pressures, they need to be monitored. So when you start medication, you need to check whether it's worked or not. And how and do you how check? Would you, how would you check? So you check, one is a non-invasive follow-up by CIC diaries, which is very important. You can't follow up Sorry, this a what? by a clean intermittent catheterization diary record, a diary record. But how can that measure the pressure? No, it doesn't measure the pressure. So, you so see we're worried about the pressure, no, aren't we? So we see the CIC diary record to see whether the patient has incontinence episodes in between the CIC, the catheterization. That's okay. one clue to what's happening. But of course, these and you nitrate. But these patients may not have much incontinence. They may not. They that, may not. Which is what makes them so dangerous, oh, yes. isn't it? But the, if this patient was really dangerous, he would not have survived to the age of 33. The fact that oh. he survived to 33 with this background, this patient actually... As you would say. No, I don't agree. In the, that one. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, most of the patients with, spi with, with open spinal dysraphism, if they're not managed well and if they've got bad bladders, they actually land up with renal insufficiency well before this age. So what would you have so, that you have more faith in than antimuscarinics? Say that again? What would you do that you have more faith in than antimuscarinics? So you have a choice of antimuscarinics, use of Botulinum, which doesn't work well with poor compliance. At least if it's predominant poor compliance, I don't find it working well. Sorry, botulinum doesn't work? If it's just poor compliance, it doesn't work well, at least in my well, hands. If it's, well, if it's is, just is that what Church showed originally? I think... You remember, Church was using... I mean, the first was, studies... What Sanjay was trying to say, I don't know. The first that. studies on botulinum toxin were in spinal cord injury patients, weren't they? But, I mean, I think I'm concerned about this patient because of two reasons. One is that the pressure going up and they should have, as you said, slowed down. Because if they slowed the speed and still the pressure remained high, this guy is not leaking. It doesn't mean, mean anything to me that he's 33 or 35. Mm. That would sell to me that this is dangerous. Mm. And my first intervention is CI, intermittent cell catheterization. See, I see, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I would do intermittent cell catheterization and yeah. add on anticholinergics. My view is, Anticholinergics do bring down pressures, but are not in isolation. You need to have intermittent catheterization. So that is very, very important. Isolated anticholinergics is not a good idea. Yeah. So, so in case you misunderstood, I meant intermittent so catheterization the good news, with the anti The good news here is that he has a good bladder capacity. So he's got a bladder capacity of about 600 mLs. Um, excuse me, the run out of battery. Um, so the good news is he's got a big bladder. So if you look at his compliance, it doesn't really change. It doesn't really change till about 350. So your idea of anticholinergic is quite reasonable because you might be able to move this along a bit like this. So he might, he might be safe on on anticholinergic. As long as we demonstrate by doing this study, because th I'm saying the person who did the study should have slowed down. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and yeah. did that. The, another thing, actually, if you go back to your void, the x-ray which you have shown, it's a filling because there is a catheter in there. So I was wondering whether this was done again because the prosthetic reflux which you have shown, we usually would see with a voiding film. That film is not voiding. No. It, there is a catheter inside and the whole bladder is over distended. Yeah. So my view is whether Thank you. they repeated it. Yeah. Because that reflux is not possible with the filling catheter in. No. So that would again tell us that it's dangerous because this guy has DSD. 
So that intraprostatic reflux, which is, should not be in the filling phase, so I assume that that was done earlier and they have a DSD. So with DSD, I am extremely concerned because the DSD is one factor in most of the neurological But you're going to deal with that by the self-catheterization yes. anyway. Yes. Yeah. So I, I, I agree with that. I think that's, that's absolutely right. So this, this appearance is not real life. If you feel like this and then do a second urodynamics with ambulatory so the patient fills from their own kidneys, the pressure will be much lower than that. But this is a useful test because it says this is a potentially dangerous bladder. Even though it's an artifact and the pressures aren't real, well, they're real, but they wouldn't occur in real life. It's an artifact which is very useful because it alerts you as... Uh, Professor Sinner said, you've got to keep a close eye on this patient. So, can I complete about the CIC diary part here? So about the what? About the diary record here. CIC, the yeah, CIC yeah, yeah, diary. Yeah. So, so, the two things there, the CIC, based on the CIC diary, we can adjust the medication if they are incontinent, and most patients are. And the other is looking at the average volumes on the CIC diary, you can check back on this tracing to see where the pressures are because you're essentially interested at what's the average CIC volume and what are the pressures at that volume. So that would actually tell you whether this patient is going to be but safe. But you wouldn't want safe. to do a repeat urodynamics? Oh, yes. Sure. So, so I would do my, so when should yeah. we do the repeat? So I would do the repeat either when the diary record shows to me that it's okay, or I have titrated my anti-muscarinics based on the voiding diary and reached the ceiling dose. At that so point, if, I would do my repeat test. So if he was no better on the voiding diary, you wouldn't bother with the anti no, I would escalate the dosage you, until I reach the ceiling dose, and right. then I would do the repeat. Well, once you've done all that, would you then just go on to the next treatment rather than repeat the urodynamics? No, I would repeat urodynamics, okay. always. Okay. So, I, so the, the point is how to decide when to repeat. And so I would what's the next treatment? When the escalating antimuscarinics haven't brought the pressure down enough. Then the next treatment is the uh, Botox injections. Yeah. Right. And yeah. that's very effective in the neurogenic yeah. bladder. Yeah. And you have to give uh, higher doses. Yeah. Usually we give 200, but one can go up to the 300 yeah. international unit. That is the one thing. And one thing I was like, you were asking how to monitor the other thing. One more, more important thing while repeating the urodynamics is doing a ultrasound yeah. to keep checking whether any yeah. dilatation is coming or not. That will be the another non-invasive method of upper tract changes. Yeah. So that is big, also very important. I mean, there's a, the, the evidence base for all we're talking about is really quite poor. And I, I brought together all the spinal cord injury urologists in the UK. And we wrote a paper which was in the BJ Urology. And it had 40 unanswered questions in the discussion. I wrote down a list of all the questions that we had no answer to. And some of this was it. So how do you follow patients up, spinal cord injury patients up? There's no evidence for this. Some people do it by um, urodynamics every 6 to 12 months, but there's no evidence that for improved outcome. Others say you don't need to do that. All you need to do is regular ultrasounds to make sure that you don't go from normal upper tracts to dilated upper tracts. So it would be a very good research project for USI to sponsor. Not with money, you understand, but with organization, because nobody really knows what the right algorithm is. And if you don't have to do, I mean, for these patients having urodynamics when you've got a spinal cord injury, all these things are a lot of trouble. And if you could do regular ultrasound rather than urodynamics, that would be a real a real bonus for patients, I think. Two points regarding the Botox. Uh, one is that uh, the two largest trials on the basis of which they approved the botulinum toxin, in which they actually studied spinal cord injury and multiple sclerosis, the word compliance does not even come up in either of those two papers. You do a search function on compliance, it's not there. They don't discuss it all. So I'm not sure whether their patients never had a poor compliance, they didn't check for it, what happened. The other is patients like this, in whom for a large period of time the treatment is delayed. They are the right. patient, over a large period of time. The treatment is delayed. So this patient started off with, had a, uh, uh, presumably did not start intermittent catheterization at birth. Yeah. So this kind of a patient is much more likely to have a fibrotic, poorly compliant bladder compared to a patient who starts intermittent catheterization at birth. And, yeah. and there's a big difference in outcomes in yeah. those patients. 
And, and so that begs the question. Well, are you going to talk about it when you pre present your case, maybe? Yeah. Okay. I, so lots of I, interesting points here. Mr. Um, Abraham, if I can just um, oh, sorry, yeah. raise a point about what was mentioned about Nitin, that this looks like a DSD. Here it is. Why, why do you say it looks like a DSD? No, no. He we, mentioned we on, the, on, on the micturating cysto. This is a different or patient. Filling is the, not the same patient, isn't no, it? This is a different patient. Correct. So in this, I wanted to just ask you, uh, would you call this actually, this bladder is uh, it's actually acontractile, isn't it? What would um, you well, mention about the voiding in this? It's, uh, it's not acontractile because he has detrusor overactivity, so there is some detrusor contraction. But he won't empty his... He voiding. Won't be able to, he I can't meant empty in the voiding phase. Sorry? I meant... In the voiding phase, he's not contracting at all, well, isn't it? There is, there is some urine, urine flow here. And you can see that's roughly when the pressure comes down. So as soon as he starts to pass urine, there is a fall. But the point about it is he can't empty his bladder. Yeah. So um, as, as everyone has said, he needs, to, he needs to use intermittent catheterization. So I think uh, we agreed intermittent catheterization with anticholinergics see what happens, and then move on to botulinum toxin. But I think I would be very hopeful in somebody of a bladder this size that you wouldn't need to do anything beyond that. Do you agree? So beyond that, if this had been a bladder, if this had been 150 ml, okay, we'd all be saying, well, maybe this patient is going to need an ileocystoplasty. I mean, we still do these operations, don't we, in neurological patients. I think one of the points which Sanjay mentioned, I think with, I would like to emphasize that he used the word titration of anticholinergics. It is very important in this neurogenic patients that you need to up the anticholinergics and it is not the usual dose. You may require a much higher dose to achieve a therapeutic effect. So you shouldn't call it a failure of an anticholinergics unless you have actually used the maximum dose possible. So why are we able to do that? Because if you try and up the dose of anticholinergics in a normal patient, they tell you, no, I'm not taking any more. How is it? It doesn't, how they, is it? They, it is one of the commonest observations that neurogenic patients yeah. do not react yeah. to the side effects the way the normal patients yeah. react. And we don't know why. Don't know. I don't know why anyway. No, that's true. So you can just push the dosage up um, until it either doesn't make any difference or they get side effects. Okay, well, this is another case of somebody who wasn't really looked after desperately well. So this was a, a lad who was born with an intraspinal dermoid, um, which he had removed at the age of three. And then age 25, he had removal of bladder and prostate calculi. Age 30, same again. He'd been incontinent. He was better as an adult. He'd, he wouldn't use intermittent catheterization. He had occasional leakage and the need for pads. Um, so the last stone was removed a long time ago in 91. Ultrasound showed a normal upper tract. He then disappeared. He's quite a difficult and interesting man. I haven't actually seen him for years because he's disappeared again. But he had bilateral hydronephrosis and then was noted to have a discharge from the scrotum. His incontinence got worse and he had, a good, he had a normal serum creatinine, but you see he had a good flow rate, but he left a considerable residual urine. So I'll just show you some nice historical pictures. So you can see where he's had the laminectomy to get rid of the, uh, the intraspinal dermoid. Um, and you can see this is a plain x-ray, a big bladder stone, and then another opacity there. And if you look at that on an IVP, you can begin to understand he's got a fir tree bladder, he's got no upper tract dilatation at this stage, uh, and again there's an opacity there in the same place that was the second uh, apparent stone. And now you can see the anatomy. Here's his seminal vesicles, um, here's his bladder looking nicely fir tree. You can just about imagine there's a stone there, and this is his prostatic fossa with a large prostatic stone. This is sphincter level. So I just show you those because they're rather pretty pictures. And here you can see it from the AP and you can nicely see the lobes of the prostate filled with calcium. 
and the bladder neck here. So we did urodynamics eventually on him and um, you can see here we've got bladder, rectum, detrusa uh, and here you can see that cough for cough subtracts out well good quality so we can interpret it. So obviously he's like the last person, he's got, he's got poor compliance. But this chap, as I said, was not very, he was not very cooperative. He wouldn't do intermittent catheterization. He luckily was getting away with it. His, his serum creatinine stayed okay. He continued to have a leak. And eventually he got fed up with his leak. And, and then I saw him at this point. And actually he was, I drew this picture and he was leaking from here. And as you watched it, you could see it just sort of dripped slowly. So actually, because he didn't want to have, he didn't really want to have anything to do with doctors. He just wore a pad, and then two or three times a day he threw the pad away. So I mean, this is interesting because where's this coming from? This was urine. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Epididymal yeah. void. Yeah. So this urine was coming from his bladder into his prostatic urethra and reverse up the vas and coming out through his scrotum. So what, what operation would you do? First thing, first thing we have to remove these stones. No, oh, no, we did that. that uh, these were old pictures. I just showed you because they were fun pictures. The stone's all gone. So is he still doing intermittent catheterization or not? No, he won't do it. He won't do it? Too much trouble. Can we offer him metrofenaf if he can do it? No, I mean, how do, we, how do we get rid of the, how do we get rid of the drips, the dripping uh, scrotum? Uh, that probably once the bladder pressure will go down, oh, then no. probably it might. Too much trouble for him. So we just did a vasectomy, and that worked. Well, we never saw him again. I assume it worked. <laughs> but then, even even if the high pressure remains, he, he may start leaking where did you did the vasectomy yeah. also. Or well, maybe it did, but he didn't come been, back. This might have been protecting his kidney. Not much. No. <laughs> <laughs> he drops, he's just few drops coming out. Well, I just think he's a funny case, you know. He's a funny man, a strange man. Most of our patients are very cooperative, but he wasn't. So this is, this is a different problem. Again, it's neurological. A 60-year-old man with severe dementia, so a real Alzheimer's because he's young. Five-year history of frequency, urgency, intermittency, feeling of incomplete emptying, and terminal dribble. He was on tamsulosin and finasteride, but his sim he was complaining of his symptoms. So he could express himself. He wasn't aphasic. What would you do for him? I mean, work him up in the usual way. I mean, regardless of the dementia, obviously we need to understand his higher functions, but an ultrasound scan with a pre and post Roy bladder volume, a Euroflow, uh, Euroflowmetry. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether he can complete a patient questionnaire. He might not be able to do that. Uh, some assessment of the volume of urine uh, that he's passing in 24 hours, at least if, he's, if you're not able to do a diary record. So uh, I think Professor Sinner's message is you treat him as an ordinary person, which I think is correct. He's a standard person until proved otherwise. So uh, we examined him, and he would tolerate being examined. He, did he have a palpable bladder? Yes. Palpable Maybe bladder, I mean yeah. an impalpable bladder. Normal neurology, normal external genitalia, moderate prostate. He had, he with, with help had done a bladder diary. Uh, he wasn't getting up at night and he was voiding decent volumes. So you wanted a, um, you wanted a flow rate so you get a pressure flow study. Uh, so I agree with you, we would do a flow rate and an ultrasound first. But here's his pressure flow study. And it's interesting really, isn't it? Because here's his flow, which is maximum flow is seven. Okay. But look at his detrusor pressure during voiding. His detrusor pressure 
is 125. So 125 minus two lots of, well here it's just, let's say it's five. 125 minus 10, 115, he's well obstructed. But that's not at the point of maximum flow. The Has point of maximum flow is here, easier. when his detrusor pressure is actually about 30 or 35. 35 minus two lots of seven is 20. So what's going on here? There's a delayed relaxation of his pelvic, a delayed relaxation of his pelvic floor is right at sphincter. He has difficulty to relax his outlet. I'm just looking at the further flows here. The further flows here are going with pelvic floor contraction. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, going with uh, detrusor contraction. He is straining at the end, but during the middle here, he's not straining at all. So you have to say that he was poorly relaxing, either his pelvic floor or his sphincter, but I'm, I'm not, I don't know that that's got anything to do with dementia. Yeah, that might you? not be the whole story. I'm not saying that that's the entire diagnosis. Hmm? I'm not saying that's the entire diagnosis. I'm no, no, but I'm, yeah. I'm agreeing with you. I can't see any other explanation. If, if he goes from being very obstructed, if he goes from being very obstructed here to not being obstructed, his prostate can't change. The only thing that can change is the relaxation of the pelvic floor and the external sphincter. But I don't see particularly why that's got anything to do with dementia. We also have the evidence you can see when the pressure starts going, there is no urine output. So it took long time to relax his pelvis before he starts widening. So hey, relaxation is delayed. Where are you talking about? Relaxation is inadequate. Here. But there is a delay in the initiation of urine. So he took time to relax some, some of the... Well, it, yeah, but sometimes you, you could say that's a delay, a delay in reaction, in relaxation. But in somebody who's very obstructed, all it means is it takes that long to get to what's called the opening pressure. However, I think you're right in this case because, because you know, we can see here that he doesn't appear to be that obstructed. So I think he's an interesting man because he throws up some questions which I can't really answer very confidently. So the free flow was interrupted, maximum flow was eight. He left a big residual urine. He had filling cystometry which showed detrusor overactivity and urgency. And he was voiding then, the urodynamicist said that he was voiding off uh, an involuntary contraction. So that means there's a small involuntary contraction there, but this is in fact an involuntary contraction. Now you know that during urodynamics because the patient sitting there, you have not asked him to void. So the pressure goes up and the patient's going, I need to void, I need to void. And you're trying, you're hoping that it'll go down again so you can continue filling. So that's what we mean by voiding off a, an involuntary contraction. So that's the case with him. So this, he's hanging on He's certainly at this point hanging on with his pelvic floor. Can I ask, what is the practice in your unit when you already have a patient who has an 800 ml PVR documented? So when you start your urodynamic study, do you empty it or you keep that residue and then start the same yeah. Okay. Well, um, I don't think we knew in this case that he had 800. Bladder. But if we did know, if we knew somebody had a residual urine, and they were not doing intermittent catheterization, we would ask them, please go and empty your bladder as well as you can. Then we would catheterize them, we'd fill on top of the residual urine, and then at the end of the test, we'd empty the bladder and measure the residual urine at the end. If they were doing intermittent catheterization, we'd say, go and empty your bladder as far as you can, and then use your catheter to completely empty your bladder. So I, I guess that's what you were suggesting yeah, you no, do. I'm saying the interpretation of this trace yeah. would depend on what was done, because this patient had a clinically palpable bladder as per your history. Yeah. So I'm assuming that that information was there, yeah. that he's had a palpable bladder. Yeah. So there is a difference, some of the units will empty and then refill it, to that extent and then take the study from there yeah. or start study immediately on a full 800 ml residue. So, so we filled on top of his residual urine. Yeah, uh, and the good thing about, about him is in fact that even, or even though he's got a very big bladder, his filling pressure is okay, it's safe. So in our unit, if the patient had a phasic contraction, 
and then went into a kind of a void like this, uh, we would actually do a repeat cycle and terminate the filling before that point and try and make him void again volitionally. Because it's very difficult to rely on a trace where the patient has already produced a phasic contraction well, and then you ask him to void. Uh, it's difficult to rely on that. Sometimes if you do another cycle that way, you'll get a very good idea of actually the, what the voiding pressures are. I'm not sure we could with him because he wasn't, he wasn't that cooperative. And, and have you noticed that in some patients, they cannot void unless they have an involuntary contraction. And they use involuntary contractions as a means of starting their voiding contraction. So they can't void when you want them to void. You have to wait until they get an involuntary contraction and then let them void. So ideally, I agree with you. You try and do it when, they, when their bladder is relaxed and then you say, please initiate a void. But in neurological patients, of course, that, that can be quite different. Yeah, I'm just asking, like, when we see patient with the palpable bladder, our practice is to slip a catheter, drain the bladder, and then call him after uh, 10 days, 14 days, then do the urodynamics because we will over distend that palpable bladder is a diffuser fatigue and we may not get the proper interpretation. So let rest to the bladder and then do the study after few days and then uh, we might get a better uh, picture. I, I think the problem of doing that is that you, you change the dynamics very markedly. So um, we, we found that if you empty the bladder and then leave the patient with a catheter in. When you then try and do urodynamics, you can't get anything like the volume in. So say they start with a liter, and you empty them, you leave them for two or three weeks, bring them back to the urodynamics, you can only get two or 300 ml into the bladder. And this was a very common finding. Um, and I'm, I'm not quite sure why it was like that. But that's, that was also true of the high pressure chronic retentions that you sometimes see with prostatic obstruction, who are not neurological as far as we know. They don't have any neurological signs. So high pressure bladders, if you empty them fully and leave a catheter in, then you can't do, you wouldn't get the same findings. Another question I have regarding this patient is a patient with this clinical findings, and I had done, a, suppose, an ultrasound on him and had an 800 ml into his bladder, he would definitely would have had a neurologist assessment telling about his mental status. And if the decision based on that, that he's a guy who does not even remember, that he will not even remember to go to the loo, no. is, then the question would be, do I need a urodynamics? Because here, making the diagnosis of outlet obstruction, am I going to offer him surgery? And if I'm not going to offer him surgery, and he's going to remain on a catheter, then do I need urodynamics, is the question. Well, I think, that, I think the legitimate question here is to choose the, the lesser of two evils. So if you knew he had a big residual urine, the issue is, is he safe? One is, is he safe? His upper tracts are okay, so he is sort of safe. And then, are we gonna have to do something in the future? And the choice is between catheters and an operation. Now the problem with demented patients is they're terrible with catheters. So intermittent catheterization, unless somebody was going to do it for him. And then probably, you know, he might start getting aggressive because he doesn't understand why somebody's doing that. He'll pull out catheters. So, so in a way, in some of these patients, it's better to do a TURP and just say, well, the it's going to be difficult for 48 hours, you know, but to do that. And in fact, well, interestingly, um, we decided with the, with the carers that he wasn't going to be, it's going to be really difficult to do a TURP on him because he probably wouldn't cooperate. And then suddenly, he forgot about all his symptoms. He stopped complaining to his carers and we just carried on doing nothing really. So it That's just shows you have to treat people in a holistic way and you have to react in a different way. In somebody like this, you can't, although we start off quite rightly to investigate him properly, then when it comes to the treatment, you have to really be practical. You can't go and say, well, he needs to do four times a day intermittent catheterization. He's never going to agree to that. And even yeah. if he agrees to it, as you say, he'll the, forget. The problem why I mentioned this is it is probably very different in the UK. But 
in India today, if you do a urodynamics on a person who is demented and who has 800 ml residue and you have no plans to empty him, you will put him to urosepsis. So that's, you might do, yeah. Yeah, so that is the biggest risk here. So yeah. that is the reason I asked that question. But you could many a times, I would rather, unless he is willing or there is a carer available yeah. to do intermittent catheterization on yeah. him, post CMG, yeah. CMG doing on this chap is nothing yeah. but dangerous. So I think yeah. it, there is a point I drive, want to drive here, otherwise you know what will happen is, yeah. you say, oh, CMG would do, but I think I would never do. Quick one, Sanjay, and then you're on. So, another favorite for all urologists, the man with Parkinson's. Don't we love to see a man with Parkinson's and wonder what we should be doing? So this chap, nice man, 10-year history of Parkinson's, as usual, overactive bladder symptoms. I think all the, uh, all the Parkinson's patients I see have overactive bladder. Is this true or not? Most. Most, okay. Uh, and voiding symptoms, difficulty emptying, and when you met him, he obviously had rigidity. You know, he was a real, he was a real shuffler. Um, and tremor. Prostate didn't feel very big. So you're going to ask for urodynamics, which we do. And, well, you see, what I can't remember is whether this equates to his tremor which it might do. Anyway, this is his voiding phase, and you can see uh, the quality is good, coughs are well subtracted, um, and you can see that he has involuntary detrusor contractions, urgency at that point. So he does have uh, detrusor overactivity causing overactive bladder. And, and his flow rate is really low for, his pressure is extremely high, it's 180, so he's very severely obstructed. He has normal upper tracts. So the conundrum is, what do you feel about operating on Parkinson's patients? Not on uh, surgery won't be the first choice. Again, uh, the option Operating would not be the, not first, the first choice. Not the first choice. I agree. Yeah. Because unless somebody walks in properly, they won't be able to do it. Because the difficulty to pass urine will be converted into incontinence, so we'll not operate on him because he has a prosthetic obstruction probably and he's already on, uh, no, I'll put him on uh, treatment for prostate and see what happens. Definitely not operation as the first option. Would you put him on anti-muscarinics? Not now. Dr. Rajiv mentioned um, botulinum toxin in, in his presentation just no, now. No, we will put him on uh, alpha blocker and anticholinergic. And anticholinergic, they will require anticholinergic. Otherwise, he will have, uh, he has symptoms and he will improve with anticholinergic. I must admit that I am not so shy of offering. When my Sorry. urodynamics, yes, when urodynamics have conclusively shown me bladder outlet obstruction, there is a very small risk. Anyway, many, many of them require anticholinergics. So, the problem with this patient is I, we haven't given the preoperative residue, but lot of them will have residue. Lot of these patients who are obstructed also have a residue. So, I think yes, you can definitely try a medical treatment, but if the medical treatment doesn't improve him and I have urodynamically proven that he's obstructed, then I won't be shy of offering a TRP. There's a reasonable evidence to show now that it is we have taken this Parkinsonism and bladder outlet obstruction to, to a different level because of the, level, the kind of studies and the kind of experience which was available where there are no good urodynamics were performed. But when you take a decision which is based on proper urodynamics, an obstructed patient would benefit. There's a recent publication on uh, which I forget where they've shown that very clearly. So it is no longer a taboo to operate on a patient with, uh, with Parkinson's, but you should be never be operating on them without a proper urodynamic proof. But I, I think the key thing you said was with a residual urine. Yes. Because in my experience with Parkinson's patients, the overactive bladder does not go away after surgery. So your only chance of helping the patient is that they have a decent sized residual urine. So after your TURP, you hope they empty it. Now that's assuming that his rigidity has nothing to do with his voiding dysfunction. Because it may be that he can't relax his pelvic floor because of his rigidity. And therefore he can't 
get uh, um, a proper voiding reflex. Well, he can get a voiding reflex because he can obviously here get a contraction. But if that is not accompanied by pelvic floor relaxation, then he may still, after surgery, not be able to void. Have you, have you no, seen that? No, I think there is a, that what you are talking of so-called bradykinesia or the that won't produce a flow like this and won't produce a detrusor contraction like this. Yeah. There is a very different trace yeah. when you can actually feel that it is happening an intermittent rise of pressure yeah. and the flow is a staccato pattern. Yeah. So that is not the one which you would offer surgery for. What I am saying is that on a proper video urodynamics, when you are actually showing that there is no sphincteric issue, the patient is actually obstructed, there are no, the, it is not getting obstructed at the level of sphincter, then I think we are very reasonably certain that the diagnosis is prostatic, as a benign prostatic obstruction, then only you should offer. If there is a doubt, don't offer. But my view is that I think very clearly the, this particular flow rate and this trace, to my mind, is not because of sphincter. This is definitely prostatic obstruction. Okay. All right. Good. Sanjay, it's over to you. I'm going to dis... What have you done in this patient? Sorry? What have you done in this patient? Well, this patient didn't have any significant residual urine, so we haven't operated on him. Because if they have no significant residual, I don't, I don't see an improvement so in their symptoms. Yeah, we've given him medication. Yeah. But again, I don't, I, I don't feel that medication works as well in Parkinson's patients. But I don't know whether that, there's never been a trial to look at how good antimuscarinics or OAB treatment is in Parkinson's. So as you know, there are very few neurological trials. They also get the Parkinson's which are also taking care of the residue. They also help in that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Professor Abrams, you can please take a seat there. And there are two questions still for you. So there are a couple of questions still. What is the role of apomorphine test in these patients? But Sorry, alpha-1? Apomorphine test, like you give oh, apomorphine. Oh, I, I have no idea. We don't use it. Anybody use an apomorphine test? Can you tell us about it? No, that's what any patient with Parkinson's disease who has got voiding dysfunction, so what is the component by prostate and what is the other component by okay, the disease yeah, itself? Yeah. So how to distinguish how much is contributed by this component and how yeah. much is contributed by this? So give apomorphine and repeat the test and then you can see. Do you use it? <laughs> no, I don't use ah, it. So I can, uh, uh, Anybody use it? This apomorphine was described at least 20, 25 years ago. Yeah. And now the neurologists have far better way of, but, but basically the apomorphine used to do is to control the Parkinsonism symptoms. Now they have better drug because dopa, levodopa is available and it's far better controlled. So the Parkinsonism medically treated much better. So once the Parkinsonism is under control, then there is, there is no reason to believe that you have to do apomorphine. So I have, my neurologist never ask us to use apomorphine, so it's not used at all. It is mentioned in the old camp, not now. Okay. For the patient who had this detrusor sphincter dyssynergia, would you consider Botox into the external sphincter? I mean, Parkinson's don't get... Not Parkinson's, the previous patient. Oh, right. Um, well, there's a little bit of literature, isn't there, on it? Not very good literature on it, so I, I have no experience of At it. At best, about 60%. Have you used it? Yes, 60% of patients are supposed to have enough relief or lowers the pressures in the bladder or reduces the amount of residual urine. They may not void fully well, but bringing about... I don't know if some. So, whatever else. few patients that we've injected, our experience in terms of patients getting off intermittent catheterization has not been good. Most patients don't get off. In fact, none of my patients got off. The other is, if it were to work, uh, then it's it's likely it'll work for a shorter period of time because it's a striated muscle you're injecting into, not a smooth muscle. Yes. Uh, so, you'll need to repeat your injections every one or two months instead of six months or nine months. Uh, so at least in my hands, it doesn't seem to give good results. Whether I have the wrong technique, don't inject into the right place, I'm not sure. But at least in my hands, I'm not able to reproduce the results of, say, Chancellor. And uh, I mean, he seems to find a good outcome in everything. I'm not able to find it. Nitin? I agree with you. What I'm saying, what I think, Venki, your experiences, in, what I understand is in mostly non-neurogenic women. 
the neurogenic it's a big of a problem because you can't get rid of a CIC so it's too expensive when a patient anyway has to do CIC and the neurogenic sphincter dyssynergia theoretically it is effective but practically it makes difficulty because the patient still have to do CIC while the idiopathic retention women uh, I think it is far more okay. useful because they okay. get rid of it. Right. Sir, what's ideal management for PCS There is no management. No, he said underactive, not acontractile. He said underactive, not acontractile. Yeah, so is that underactive mm. uh, thing, there is nothing which improves the detrusor contractility. So again, BPH don't use the word; he will get very upset <laughs> because <laughs> because whole two days we have been talking about that BPH is a histological diagnosis. So what I think what if you are trying to ask that the obstruction with underactivity is that is what you are yeah. saying. It is very difficult, nobody knows. So, it, so you, you can't have a one blanket answer to that. It has Absolutely. to be a customized solution depending yeah. on how much is the underactivity and what's the component of obstruction. So some patients might benefit. Uh, there are patients who will benefit from surgery. It's, it's some element of underactivity. I mean, if you go by 100 as the cutoff for contractility, some element of underactivity is fairly common. So it's, it depends on what level of underactivity no, you're talking that. about. The question is, what is the patient's problem? So this is then I am concerned about the diagnosis yes, of underactive yes, detrusor, yes. which is probably wrong. So what I am trying to say is one thing which you mm -hmm. must remember, usually urodynamics gives an answer, but don't throw your clinical sense out of the window. I mean what you are describing is a chronic retention with uh, b b upper tract dilatation. I think I won't do, that's my policy. In a patient like this, I, what I am doing for, is there a doubt of obstruction here? No. So, if I don't have obstruction, I will not do. I will so tell I the I patient, I will explain to the patient that you have a chronic retention. Be, there is, when you examine them, there is no neurological disease. It is no other cause suspected. I would say if you agree, I will offer you TURP. Guarded prognosis. I think you will do well. We, we have lots of patients. You agree with it, I will do operation. If you don't want, you can go on CIC and and we remain on CIC. I am not sure that every time in that situation, Eurodynamics has given me the answer to have the confidence that it is the test which I can use for everybody. I know the Bristol group uses uh, Eurodynamics. There are other people who use. My experience, our experience is very straightforward. I don't do Eurodynamics in acute retention. We assume it is obstructed. Similarly, chronic retention with upper tract damage is a high pressure chronic retention. It is a sequence of bladder outlet obstruction. What I can do is relieve his obstruction. What I cannot guarantee him is a recovery to his bladder. That is the only question. Most of the time it reverses. If somebody wants a guarantee, you may do a CMG, may help, that is useful. If CMG is equivocal, what are you going to do? Same thing. Either offer surgery or put him on CIC. Let's, so leave, it, let's leave it at that. Thanks, Nathan. We've got six minutes each for two cases to quickly discuss. So, um, so uh, sorry? No, not another panel. I'm supposed to finish off with one case and Laksh uh, uh, Joseph is another case. Okay, okay. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so this is a nine-year-old girl who underwent a bilateral ureteric reimplantation two years ago when she presented somewhere else with recurrent febrile episodes and was noted to have bilateral ureteric reflux. So at the age of seven years, she was noted to she presented with recurrent febrile episodes. Was noted to have bilateral reflux, and this was the MCUG on the basis of which she had a reimplantation. So, would anybody like to comment on this reimplantation? On the decision for this reimplantation? Okay. Right. So, there are enough clues on this MCUG to suggest that this reflux might not actually be primary at all. And you know, if the reflux is not primary, the patient is unlikely to benefit from the reimplantation. So, she presented two years later. She's got you know, incontinence, voiding difficulty. She leaks both with and without a feeling of urgency. She has constipation. She's no obvious neurological symptoms on physical exams. There's no very clear cut feature suggesting an overt neurological problem, but there were subtle signs to suggest there might have been an underlying neurological problem. The current, oops, the current findings, the repeat MCUG was done about a month ago. And this MCUG, I'm sh sorry that red arrow is here. It should have been somewhere. Oh, it's here, right. So this is the repeat MCUG done for this patient about a year and a half after the, the re-implantation was done. And uh, you can see st still the bladder contour is not normal. You can see uh, there's a, a either a residual reflux or a recurrent reflux on the left side. Uh, an obvious bladder morphological abnormalities. Perhaps some a little bit of dilatation of the, uh, of the proximal urethra. Uh, 
her height is 123 and weight height and weight both are showing that she is actually undernourished so she's between the 10th and the 25th percentile if you go by the indian academy of pediatrics uh, app which is available now which you should all uh, have on your mobiles if you actually treat these pediatric patients uh, so what next for this patient how is the kidney function so yes. present creatinine is 1.6 which translates into an egfr of, of 32 gfr is GFR is 32. Uh, I mean to say, CKD4 is reached to the CKD4, and the patient is now sleeping. The first thing, most important thing, is put this patient on. Was the patient doing intermittent catheterization? No, this patient that was not on anything. The patient was just incontinent, has bilateral hydronephrosis and elevated creatinine, um, and uh, that's her uroflow at this point of time. Uh, so an abnormal uroflow. The uh, first thing is, uh, in this situation, probably put a catheter. Right, just right. to decompress, let the renal function settle, right. let the infection settles, and then we'll do the urodynamics to reassess. So I th I, that's a very important point uh, Professor Ananth makes, and I'll just show you a subsequent slide to show the, the evidence behind that point. Uh, the initial management of the patient conservatively can actually recover function, uh, some element of renal uh, dysfunction, despite the fact that treatment has been delayed for very long periods of time. So even if it's been years for patients, let's say a, a patient with open, open spinal dysraphism comes at the age of six years for the first time, you might still be able to recover substantial renal function by the initial uh, conservative management by catheterization and anti and CIC. Right, so he asked for the urodynamics, and I, we've got two traces here. I'll just put both because the first one is not very uh, perfect, so I'll just put both here for you to see. Uh, so these are the two tracings we have. Would anybody like to comment on this? Is it visible? So we filled, I think, 140 ml here. You can see a steady rise in pressure. I'm not very happy with the P-vesicle recording here. This is not a good record, which is why we've got two traces. Although it's subtracted reasonably well, you can see the coughs have subtracted well. So they've gone, uh, gone ahead and completed this whole thing. But you can see the fine pattern trace has not actually been reproduced in both the lines perfectly. So we have two traces on it. At the end of filling, this patient did not seem to produce any uh, detrusor contraction at all and just voided with abdominal strain a little bit of uh, in here with a slow flow. I think Sanjay, you had shown, I don't know because you said she had a reimplantation. She had a reimplantation. But at the same time, the one of the x rays, which because it's not a video, you're a dynamic. It's not a video, it's a standalone. So, no, the uh, reason why yeah. I'm asking is because if she's continued to having a persistent VUR, right. this compliance may be misleading. Oh, yes. She may oh, yes. be far more poorly absolutely, compliant absolutely. than this. So, that's the issue. So, uh, I want to know because you had shown one film, absolutely, but there was absolutely. still a reflex, reflex and a dilated right, ureter. Right. So I don't think we should get fooled by thinking that. No, no, no. This, so I'm, I, in fact, I would put it the other way around. That in the presence of reflux, this any rise in pressure you should view with suspicion. So in a child, if you have the child has got reflux. Uh, and uh, you, are you are checking storage pressures, you should view any rise in pressure with suspicion. So obviously the compliance can't be better than this. Yeah. It could be any, any amount worse than this depending on how much uh, urine has actually got siphoned up into the upper tracts. A very important point. The okay. other thing is that there her local neurological examination or full neurological examination was entirely normal. Yeah, so there were some... I, mean, I understand yeah. you said there is no overt neurological... Yeah, so there was, there was a mild reduction in an iron tone. We could not elicit a good bulbocavernosal reflux. Her imaging and her neurophysiology logical testing with the neurologist didn't show anything. So we were not able to find any obvious anatomical or functional lesion on a neuro full neurological assessment. I, it was done and it was normal. I haven't put it here, but it was done and normal. So we don't know the etiology and let me not get into the etiology. You can discuss this case with, let's say, assuming that this patient had a spina bifida operated at birth. It, you would still be able to have all the discussion, but right, this patient. Yeah, the reason yeah. I, uh, we asked that question is for the sake of thinking. Oh yes, absolutely, absolutely. If yeah. you have a focused examination right, of right, normal, right. or if your neurologist feels that there is a higher chance of finding an anomaly, yeah. of an occult anomaly. Right. On an oh, MRI. must have an MRI. Yeah. So all such so important not point, yes. necessarily routine MRI helps. Right, right, right. So Absolutely. Absolutely. So any unexplained severe lower tract dysfunction in a child, you must image the spine even if you don't find any neurological symptoms or signs to support it. So you must have an imaging at that point. Uh, so an initial, as Dr. Anand said, we put an initial indwelling catheter. We did a neurological assessment which didn't show anything. Uh, at this point, we managed her as severe lower tract dysfunction, possibly neurogenic based on the way she's presented. We put her on anti muscarinics and CIC. And, uh, her CIC records at three months showed multiple incontinence episodes, small volume CIC records. She was not overhydrated on her CIC diary. That means she was not drinking too much of water, but yet she was incontinent. And at this point, her creatinine was 1.6 with an EGFR of 41. I would like to 
would very strongly feel that if you would not found a neurological disease, that she should be called dysfunctional voiding and not labeled neurogenic. Because sure, sure. So I actually, I would, I these yeah. days, I would in fact not even call them dysfunctional because I hate to use the word dysfunctional if I don't find that this, there's a sphincteric dyssynergia. Yeah. So I would actually label them as severe low unit tract dysfunction rather than this is this is the term that I actually use for them now. I don't, I don't like using terms like non-neurogenic, neurogenic, and so on. I just write put them as severe low unit tract, unexplained or idiopathic severe low unit tract dysfunction. Recognizing that some of them might manifest an overt abnormality in follow-up, which you must look, look for. But what to do at this point of time? Uh, is, uh, is still his GFR is 41. He's still patient in his 3-4 CKD stage. And uh, that's a very bad sign. So patient will remain an intermittent catheterization. May be benefited if the not with the after anticholinergic, you might give him a Botox injection. And uh, then so, uh, so uh, Nitin, let me ask you, what's your experience with Botox in a poorly compliant bladder? Because our experience, especially we've injected a few children who had poorly compliant, isolated. So it's not a combination of NDO with poor compliance. No NDO, just poor compliance. Our experience is bad because when we repeat your dynamics. Continuous episodes becomes better and they will remain an intermittent. So we are category. looking at the safety of the bladder and I have really not found so that the, the bladder, bladder becomes safe. The safety of the bladder, it may not be, but the incontinence episodes improves. Okay. The thing is, it is so expensive and so transient in its effect. Most of the patients which we see won't afford it anyway. So I think it's, I never, it is not in our environment, armamentarium. Because here, the CIC is the key. Anticholinergics, you are given toltrotin, I never use it more. I, I still have more, far more faith as far as neurogenic, so-called bladders are concerned with oxybutynin. They do uh, tolerate oxybutynin quite well. So I put them on oxybutynin, maximum dose possible follow them up on that. That is what we would do here. Sh we'll always, I'll counsel the parent that she is going to head towards an end stage renal disease when she becomes a child and that is the time we'll have to decide about the safety of this bladder, whether the, with all this treatment, does the bladder become safe for a transplant in this bladder or at that time would need something done to this bladder. To so, so let me ask uh, uh, Joseph, maybe, yeah. would you ever think of augmenting this patient no. at this stage? No, because if you augment, uh, this patient will have severe metabolic acidosis Never. because he has Never. got the renal failure and that will more absorption from the bowel. That's why I am saying that in the page, this patient intermittent catheterization, anticholinergic and Botox will help you in uh, pulling for longer period rather than uh, doing anything. Augmentation probably will be the, in these patient if required, we have seen they do a lot better if you make a short segment of ileal conduit and then very short segment, but just to enough to put the ureter and they come out. And because then urine doesn't stay for long and they do not develop uh, severe metabolic acidosis. Right, so this is a paper that we've just sent to the ICS as a full abstract, a two-page abstract, and we will hopefully publish it soon. This is. 13 patients that we augmented with CKD stage 3 and 4 over a period of 10 years. These are all neurogenic bladder patients. Uh, they're all children whom we've augmented out of 79 children that we've augmented in all over 10 years. Uh, 13 of them were in CKD stage 3 and 4. This initial GFR here, this GFR is the GFR when they presented. And you can see the maximum improvement, whatever band you're seeing going up in the GFR. This is not with surgery. This initial improvement is actually just with the conservative management. So the initial GFR doubled from 24 to 52, just with initial conservative management aggressively. But what we noticed interestingly was, let me see if I can show that to you. Uh, Okay, the initial GFR was 24, at surgery it was 52, and then at one year you had a significant improvement from, uh, from pre-surgery to first year. Beyond that we didn't get any improvement, it just stabilized. So we do get some additional initial gain when you do augment these children, uh, uh, even though they present with CKD 3 and 4. We actually had very uh, 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 no major complications in these patients. So only one patient required readmission for a metabolic uh, acidosis and acute on kidney chronic insufficiency. She was a girl who had a recessed urethral meatus. They had to do a metrophen off along with the augmentation. And she came back at two weeks. The other patients, we didn't have any immediate problems long term. They had metabolic acidosis well controlled on soda bicarb. And one patient had a stone at four years. So actually our outcome in terms of managing these patients in, uh, in terms of morbidity was much less than we thought it would be. And um, 
the, 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 the gratifying thing was a drastic reduction in febrile UTI episodes. So if you look at their, the, the urinary infection episodes requiring admission pre-op and post-op, there's a dramatic reduction in that. And some yeah. modest improvements in their somatic I think growth. This is one point but I will disagree to such an extent that we have a large experience of pediatric doing the same and we have we have managed their patients now. It produces such a serious complication when they grow older and that it is becomes very difficult to manage them. The problem is you do not have a second arm here that if you would have managed them with a proper intermediate cell catheterization and anticholinergics, they would have done the same. Most of the world today is moving away from putting bladders, uh, bowel onto the bladder of young children. It was very powerful. It is a desperate resort. When no, you have to no, no, understand, what I'm yeah, is the these are the indications have to be very, very specific. That is, you have really sm small bladder, not improving with, the, as you said, a fibrotic bladder, which doesn't respond to anticholinergics. CIC so, is not able so to help. You need to improve the, the bladder capacity. The, me the median. The median yes. compliance of these patients was, I think, six or eight. So we are talking of fibrotic bladders. Not necessarily all are small capacity. So there are patients who have. Anyway, so uh, Sanjay, yeah. there is one point you can see hmm. with with even your initial treatment. Yeah. The GFR has, has come improved. Fifty two. Yeah, yeah. So, so I just said. Fifty with fifty two GFR when you do the allocystoplasty. So they had now that renal failure has the component of renal failure was now. Less. Lesser, definitely. So with that, probably they are pulling up and with the soda. Absolutely. And these are from a large pool, these are very small group of patients who actually had an augment. Yeah, so they are now. But they've been, I mean, they, we have follow-up data up to seven years now. With, the, that, anyway. with the CKD, you know, of course, of before course, yeah. that, if you see the textbook, there was that when serum creatinine more than 1.8 or 2, then one should not do it. Because at that time, GFR was not taken into consideration. With the GFR uh, of 52, Joseph, you had a case. probably you will not so see the serum creatinine is still 1.3. So probably that's how they are pulling up. Okay. Uh, I thank the panelists and Paul Professor Abrams, who's not here anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Stay back for uh, one small uh, case. I think uh, before uh, we are presenting a small case from our department because we have seen recently two cases. We are seeing the adolescent urology part of pediatric urology because once they are, like what they have said, once the augmentation is done in childhood, later it comes to urology. So one case which I am presenting, I should thank Arun for uh, borrowing this uh, case for the presentation. I don't know the answer. The answer should come from the whatever specialists are there who are not uh, sleeping and uh, towards the end of the day not fed up with uh, the urodynamic uh, sessions. It's a short history. But a long history, it's a 19-year-old girl who has come with a continuous urine leak. She is not passing urine, no way of uh, doing any voiding charts, no bowel complaints and she is using uh, pads, there is no leak. There's a significant history, at one and a half years, uh, she was diagnosed with bilateral uh, ectopic ureters and there was a cohense uh, re-implantation done. In 2003, a Ledbetter uh, MD's uh, bladder neck repair was uh, done, this was 2003. In 2005, they, she had still continuing dribbling of urine and an MCU showed a short uh, bilateral grade 3 reflex. This was following the Cohen's uh, reimplantation. There was a doubtful sacral agenesis and there was a urodynamic finding. There is not, the picture is not there. There was leaking at 20 ml. And the surgical procedures which were done at that time was she had a low urogenital anomaly and it was a cutback was done and then transverse colostomy was done. Then there was a rectal uh, anorectal anomaly repair transverse colostomy was closed and 2006 there was a mitrophin of nut so there is a colostomy there was a bilateral reimplantation there is a bladder neck repair there is a mitrophin of there was a colostomy there was a pull through no augmentation no augmentation no no there was no augmentation details we don't know because up to this 2006 uh, we don't know then there was a long period of uh, break and she has come back now with 19 years with continuous urine leak, the same thing which I have uh, told uh, earlier. And this time uh, there was a MRI of the spine because in the initial picture there were initial uh, diagnosis there was a spinal, uh, there was a sacral, uh, partial sacral agenesis which was not there. This is looking normal and there was no myelomeningocele. And there was an MR uh, urogram which was done. I will show the, there was a bifid. Uh, 
uterus was there because now she is 19 which was something which was missed so there was a uterus a didel fish and there was a malrotated lumbar kidney and there is a partial duplication of the left kidney this is a cohen's reimplantation done uh, and this was an MCU in 2018. She was not able to hold uh, much. It shows uh, reflex with the catheter. Beyond that, she was not able to hold uh, urine. And this is the urodynamic uh, tracing which was done at that time. I think this is a child who has grown up with lot of anomalies. Now 19 years, probably they are thinking of marriage. There's a uterus, a didel fees, and this is the picture. The continuous urine leak. Okay, this patient, what I will do, I will uh, discuss with the family. And if they agree, I will try to close the bladder neck, close the, and then put a, some extra tissue so that it should not leak because bladder leg closure may fail. See, patient already had a metrophen off, might augment the bladder, and then keep, keep the patient on uh, CIC. And that probably would make uh, her dry and pr probably protect the rest of the things also. So one question at this time is that Mitrofenov which they have done is totally closed off. They are not able to do anything through No, that. the Mitrofenov has that problem. Even if you do it, it has a chance to close. But I think it needs some more information here. Uh, have you done a sister, sister UA under anesthesia? It was done. Uh, it, was, uh, showing a, it was showing a small capacity bladder with gaping orifices on both sides. So she has a refluxing orifice. Yes, MC what, shows reflux. What was the capacity under anesthesia? You remember, I don't know how much. Very small because I didn't. Yeah. No, there. No, it is not there. Not there. Because it was the, the file. It is written there. Very small capacity. It was leaking when they were doing. No, no. The thing right. is, what I want to try to get it is that she her urethra may be normal. She means leaking because she has no bladder capacity. So what her problem may be just solved by an augmentation. Okay. So what we need to know is her urethral function whether the urethra is okay, if the bladder is small, that's why the first question I asked was whether they put a metrophenol with augment. So it's quite possible, so that once you augment her, provided her urethral function is normal, if there is a urethral problem, then you may have to put a sling around the urethra, augment her, and she should be able to, to be achieve at least social continence. So that will be the, the way I would look at it. So but one option is totally close off and put a metrophen off with augmentation. The second option is uh, augment and uh, put a bladder sling and uh, give uh, void. No, it depends on the no, two options which are because we yeah. have to talk but the we options. We need to, to the know the evaluation unless we know what it is. Well, why to close a bladder neck and urethra if the urethra is normal and she's leaking because of a low small bladder capacity? Because what you are describing is a very small capacity bladder. Small capacity. So the urethra normal, why to close a bladder? So I think it is. It is, I don't think that option will come in if you know already that urethra is normal and the bladder is small. So you augment the bladder. So if the urethra is not recessed and short, then the, the, a sling works very well in a female patient as long as the, so if the urethra is not short uh, uh, as it can happen and a recessed meatus with some of these patients, then a sling works very well for neurogenic female patients uh, in continence. I mean, uh, for, I mean. Uh, so, even, so even, 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 so even there it would work well. So as long, yeah. No, it was no, it was there in the first diagnosis, but subsequently it, there. Okay, it is not wrong diagnosis. So I think the first thing is to do good system based on that finding, urethra normal, augment her blood. Any other option of doing an anterior bladder wall flap, which we used to do earlier? No, the anterior bladder flap is only for the loss of urethra. If there is no loss of urethra, you are not reconstructing the urethra. The thing is, the tenago is only required for a. Uh, in other, if you have to do a urethral reconstruction, it is better to do a pipi sally or a thing because to make her socially dry. But that's a difficult problem, yeah, as as bad as metrophenol. Uh, because both of them have the same problem. People don't catheterize, they have difficulty in catheterizing after some time. Mitrofenov, there is a 30% chance of closure of Mitrofenov in uh, children when you do them. And once they close off, the reoperation rate for revision of this Mitrofenov is more than 60%. So it's not an easy option, but yeah, it's an option. Just one more uh, curiosity which comes. Uh, one of these patients, uh, one of the augmentations which you have done earlier, she came back pregnant and the OBG people had asked for intraoperative help. Always they ask, but we never needed to help because the uterus is a fantastic organ, it just comes away. But it's a good idea because when we do the augment and they are, so we are there with the obstetrician in the theatre, but I don't remember uh, where we had to actually do anything. So the uterus just comes out and Caesar is not difficult. I think we'll uh, wind up. Uh, thank you, thank you, sir. 
I'd just like to give a small clarification note regarding the case that I presented. And uh, so when patients present with significant chronic renal insufficiency despite conservative management and if the patient, uh, uh, let's say, has a GFR which is low, the usual management for the patient is now to await the patient getting into end-stage kidney failure and then performing your augment as a part of the preparation for the transplant. So you do it pre-transplant or post-transplant. So it's only a very highly select group of patients that I showed. So don't go off with the message that every patient that you get who's in stage CKD 3 or 4, you'd go ahead and augment them. So that brings us to the quiz for the evening. This quiz is primarily based on what was discussed Today, I've tried to confine myself to that because Dr. Lakshman Prabhu will be doing a quiz tomorrow and that quiz will be based on what is being, uh, will be discussed tomorrow. Um, so there are a few house rules for the quiz. Uh, it's an open house quiz, anyone can answer, but the provisio is you must raise your hand, use the microphone, identify yourself and then answer. So that's very important. Please do not answer while sitting. So raise your hands, identify yourself and answer. Uh, some questions carry a bigger prize, every question carries a prize. So there will be a prize for every question, some questions carry a bigger prize, and as usual, the quiz master's decision is final. All of you, all the faculty, everybody here is, is most welcome to comment, uh, but very brief comments. You're not allowed to go, you're not allowed to go. You can't go and prepare for your tennis game from now, you have to come back here. Okay, okay, okay. You're allowed a Euroflow Mitri record. Okay, so we'll start with the first question. Which of these is not a limitation of the IPSS? Which of these is not a limitation? So anyone who wants to answer, raise your hands and answer. Man, instead of taking a photograph of the questions, why don't you try and answer the question? That is better. <laughs> better. Okay. So no assessment. So what, which of these limits? So no assessment of incontinence, lack of adequate sensitivity to changes in symptoms, no assessment of post micturition symptoms and the lack of assessment of bother of each of the symptoms. Which of these, which of these is not a limitation? So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll preferably give it to the people who are more junior, so we'll start with the more junior. I presume you're the more junior guy. Okay, you can give the mic there, please. Give the mic, identify yourself and answer. Uh, uh, Dr. Shashank Saini, second year MCA resident, TDMC LFP. Yes. Sir, there is no question on assessment of incontinence in IPSS. No, so I said which is not a limitation. So all are limitations except. So that's not the right answer. So one more person gets one more attempt. So, uh, okay. Mm. You have another mic, that's it. Can you have two mics? Yeah, use a mic, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Hey, let's not waste time. Sir, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's Dr. Anupam from KMC Anupam. Manipal. I think its answer is B. B is the right answer. Please give him a big hand. And his prize. Where is his chocolate? Good. So the answer was B. The IPSS, as you know, is an eight-question questionnaire consisting of seven questions and a quality of life question. Limitations include lack of assessment of incontinence, post-micturition symptoms, and the bother caused by each symptom is not assessed separately. You have a single question on bother. Symptom questionnaires are sensitive to symptom changes and they can uh, be used to quantify LUTS and identify the type of symptom that are predominant but can't give you a diagnosis. Right, the next question. Which of the following is not a marker for high risk chronic urinary retention? Not a marker for high risk chronic urinary retention. Hydronephrosis, CKD stage 3, positive urine culture, or sacral ulceration. Raise your hands and answer. Please give me a mic. Identify yourself and then answer. Which is not a high risk? Sir, Karthagen. My name is Karthagen. Yeah, but it's a CKD stage 3. CKD stage 3 is not the right answer. Anybody else would like to try? Somebody who has not answered before. No answers while sitting. Please give your mic there. No answers while sitting. Dr. Nikhil from uh, Nikhil. Sir Guwahati, sir. Uh, sir, sacral ulceration. Is not the right answer. Now it's only a question of two. So it's a question whether I should take the prize home because nobody has answered it correctly. It's like 50 50 now. So who's going to do a 50 50? Okay, here. Yeah. Oh man, give me my prize. Give me my prize. Give me my prize. That prize is mine. If and please give me a big hand. Oh, thanks. Please give me a big hand. Because none of you got it right. And I'm surprised at that one. Uh, so let's see. The answer was C. Positive cultures do not represent a marker for a patient who's at high risk. We are just talking positive cultures, not symptomatic febrile UTIs. Positive culture is not a high risk in chronic retention. All the other three were high risk. 
So symptomatic recurrent urinary infections, hydronephrosis, CKD stage 3, incontinence with perineal, alt sacral ulcers, and cultures proven systemic sepsis are all markers of high risk. But a positive culture per se is not a high risk feature for a patient with chronic retention. Okay. And the AUA white paper, which we've discussed it exhaustively, defined chronic uh, urinary retention as empirically as more than 300 ml persisting more than six months, at least on two occasions you assess the patient. Right, the next question. Which of the following statements with regard to Mira Begron for OAB is false? It's got a very high affinity for beta-3 agonists. The bladder wall has three beta agonists uh, at all the three beta hydron receptors. It has a half-life of 50 hours and it reduces the efficacy of digoxin. Please again, don't sit, answer while sitting. Uh, raise your hands, uh, identify yourself and then answer. Do I see a raised hand anywhere? Okay, Mike please. Yeah. Can reduce the efficacy of digoxin. Sorry? D, and D is the right answer. Please, you, you didn't identify yourself. You need to identify Sorry. yourself in the mic, mic and then answer. Sunil from Manipal. Sorry. Right. So, uh, congratulations. You did get that answer right. The answer was D. Mira Bhagwan has a very high affinity for beta-3. Blood has all the three beta-3 uh, adrenal receptors. Uh, the half-life is 50 hours. And this is very important. There's only one drug you really need to remember when you prescribe uh, Mira Bhagwan and that's digoxin. So that's why I put it here because you must check for digoxin. So, uh, uh, if patients are in cardiac failure, they might be, and at least you must make them aware because once in a while if the patient is given, it's important. There are patients who are on digoxin. Okay, the next question. This question carries a bigger price. Uh, which of the following statements regarding sacral nerve, uh, sacral nerve response to stimulation is correct? So this carries a bigger price. S3 stimulation causes a plantar flexion of the great toe. S2 stimulation causes sensations in the leg and the buttocks. S2 stimulation causes a bellows reflex. S4 stimulation causes paresthesias in the vagina and rectum. Which of the f f one of the following four statements is right? That was the first arm that came up. Please give a mic there. Uh, I'm Dr. Vapa from Calicut. I think answer is D, S4 stimulation for paresthesia and vagina and rectum. Mm, that is not the right answer and I hope I get it right here. Yeah, I can see a very tall hand there. Right? You can use the mic. Sir, I am Dr. Manus from uh, uh, Belga. I think the answer is C, S2 simulation cause bellows. Mm, that's not the right answer either. <laughs> <laughs> Who else is going to try? <laughs> eh? Shall I show the right answer? <laughs> Can, give, give me another one. I think I am going to take the maximum chocolates today. Where is my chocolate? Okay. Uh, the answer, right answer was B. So sensations in the leg and buttock are associated with S2 stimulation. Stimulation of S2 sacral nerve causes a plantar flexion of the entire foot. Uh, S3 causes dorsiflexion. This is the one that we are interested in. So this is the one that you must remember. S3 causes dorsiflexion of the great toe. You get a bellows response. It can cause paresthesia in the rectum and vagina. So that's the one that you want. Others are not the ones that you are looking for. And S4 stimulation only causes the bellows reflex. It doesn't cause the other things. So B was the right answer here, not the others. Which statement regarding DLPP in neurogenic bladder is false? The detrusor leak point pressure is a good predictor of upper tract damage. End fill pressure should be studied in patients who fail to leak. Catheter size has a significant impact on the measurement. And DLPP is not enough to decide whether to proceed with augmentation or sphincterotomy. Which one of these four answers is false? Uh, somebody's not answered before. Uh, you've not answered before. Can, can we have a mic here? A mic here? Uh, you can, you just, just use the mic. Yeah. Identify yourself for the rest of the public and then answer, please. And Dr. Sunilma Chaudhary from Calcutta. C, sir. Answer C. C is not the right answer. Catheter size does have an impact on the DLP measurement. Yeah. Darshan from Toronto. D, DLPP is not enough for deciding. Mm, that is not the right answer either. DLP is not enough to take a, make a decision to augment or say, uh, uh, perform a sphincter in a patient. So again, it's a 50-50 for you guys. You have to get this one right. I can't carry all the chocolates home myself. Who said A? Okay, give him his chocolate. Give it to him. Although he doesn't really 
really deserve it, give it to me, is the right answer here. So actually, the, uh, it, uh, the important thing is DLPP should be looked for, so it's an important part of the measurement of uh, uh, assessment of a patient with neurogenic LUTs to help predict and prevent upper tract damage, uh, but it should not be used as a sole parameter to decide the invasive therapies. It's actually got a low sensitivity, especially the cutoff of 40 centimeters is a very poor sensitivity for predicting which patients may or may not uh, uh, develop upper tract uh, damage. Uh, other factors predict uh, uh, upper tract damage in lower uh, neurogenic LT LUTD and those are bladder compliance, the volume at which leakage occurs, the duration and amplitude of the detuser contractions and the volume at, uh, um, uh, which was obtained by CIC. So there are many other factors which get into predicting which patients are safe or unsafe and DLPB can't be used to make that decision alone. Right, which one of the following statements with regard to botulinum toxin for OAB is false? There's no evidence that repeated injections of botulinum toxin A have reduced efficacy. There is high risk of increased PVR when injecting elderly frail patients. UTI is an important consideration and reten retention rates are independent of the dosage used. Please raise your hand and answer. Somebody's not answered. I see a hand raised at the la uh, last bench. Yeah. Please identify yourself and answer. I am Jeevan from Anapai Medical College, Jeevan, sir. Tell me. Uh, there is, yes, sir. There is no evidence that repeated injections of botulinum toxin has reduced. No, it is not the right answer. There was a hand raised at the back. Can you pass it two, two rows behind you? Yeah. Uh, I think, sir, retention rates are independent. So That's the right answer. Please, what's your name? Uh, Dr. Rakesh from Government Medical College. Excellent, Rakesh. Rakesh. That is the right answer. Retention rates are dependent on the dose used. And you know that if somebody is injected 100 units, which is the OAB uh, injection dose, the retention rate ballpark figure is 5%. If you inject 200 uh, units, the ballpark figure is about 20%. That was what we were taught until the randomized trial showed slightly different results. Uh, so there's no evidence that repeated injections uh, have reduced efficacy. There's a high risk of increased PVR in injecting frail patients. Uh, UTI is an important consideration along with hematuria and retention rates are, uh, uh, are dependent of the dose, not independent, dependent of the dosage used. Okay, so with regard to neurogenic bladder, all the following are considered red flags except hematuria, recurrent UTI, loin pain, and pyuria. Somebody who's not answered before, you're not answered before, okay, give him a mic, give him a mic, please. Praveen Kumar from Salem. Praveen, give him a mic, you've got to run fast and give the mic, yeah. Pa pyuria. Pyuria is the right answer. Please give him a big hand. Good. At least somebody got something right in the first instance. Right. So, uh, what are the various red flags? So, this is from the NICE guidelines UK. Hematuria can indicate stone or tumor, recurrent UTI, uh, loin pain, recurrent catheter blocks, hydronephrosis, stones on imaging, biochemical evidence of renal deterioration. These are the list of red flags in the uh, neurogenic uh, incontinent bladder document of the NICE, gu the NICE guidelines of 2012, I think. Uh, pyuria is common in patients, especially on CIC, is best not to test and not to treat. Yeah. Okay, next question. Which one of the following statements with regard to avoiding diary is false? The bladder diary is preferably recorded in three days. The diary can help objectively quantify incontinence. It can help in the management of mixed incontinence. And multiple episodes of small volume voids suggest the possibility of stress incontinence. Answer. Please raise your hand and then answer. Somebody has not answered before. Okay, I see a, a lady raising her hand there at the back row. You can use the mic. Run and somebody run and give the mic. Who's got the mic that side? Yeah. I'm Madhuri from uh, Velour. Go ahead. Uh, option is D, multiple episodes of small That's volume. That's the right voids. answer. So, Dr. Madhuri from Velour just told you the right answer. Multiple episodes of small volume voids would suggest not stress incontinence, but puts which suggests the possibility of overactive bladder. You do a three-day uh, diary, you count the incontinence episode frequency or IEF to objectively quantify in some measure what the incontinence is. And uh, the fluid balance assessment from the diary can help in the management of mixed incontinence. Yes, it does help. Right, this question carries a bigger price. Which one of the following statements regarding botulinum toxin and neuro sacral neuromodulation is false? Botulinum toxin was noted to be equally effective when compared to sacral neuromodulation in a large RCT. Sacral neuromodulation may have a favorable impact on constipation. Sacral neuromodulation is associated with a high rate of revisions and sacral neuromodulation may result in improved voiding. Again, raise your hand and then answer. So there's a new hand I see there, use the mic. Yes, sir. Botulinum eh? toxin was noted to be equally effective when compared to... That is the right, what is the, what is, what, what's the right version of that statement? <laughs> Not equally effective. Not equal is fine, but which is more effective? 
again it's a 50 50 you can if you throw an educated guess hopefully you'll get the right answer what are you usually doing Euro modulation or bottling up? Bottling. It's got to be the right answer. Right, so the answer is A. Uh, bottling toxin is more effective, actually, was more effective. In the, there's only one randomized trial comparing the two, just one. But it's a large, well conducted randomized trial, about 300 odd patients, 364 patients. Uh, it compared bottling toxin and sacral neuromodulation in a 1 is to 1 ratio. Uh, the botulinum toxin had a reduction of minus 3.5 in the incontinence episodes versus 3.3, which was significantly in favor of botulinum toxin. You need to keep some things in mind when you interpret this trial. This was an OEB trial, but the patients actually received a 200 unit dosage of botulinum, not 100 unit. Uh, with this 200 unit dosage of botulinum, the retention rate was actually 8%, not 20%, which you would have expected based on the literature. Uh, so it was a slightly, it was a higher dose than we usually start with, at least with our OEB patients. But nevertheless, uh, a better continence rate with botulinum as compared. And actually, it was not just the continence; all other parameters of treatment satisfaction also were superior with the botulinum. So, in terms of uh, overall treatment satisfaction, better resolution of bother, uh, uh, all these were be were better, except that there was a higher incidence of UTI in patients who were injected botulinum. Uh, retention rate was eight percent. Um, Revision rates were high for sacral neuromodulation and obviously has an impact, uh, favorable impact on constipation as well as avoiding dysfunction. That's from M. Instances, from the JAMA publication. So it's a landmark publication in JAMA in 2016. That's why it went into the JAMA, not into urology journal. So you should be aware of this. Okay, next question. Which statement with regard to urodynamics in male LUTs is false? Perform urodynamics in men with bothersome voiding LUTs prior to invasive therapy if. And if you don't get this right, then Dr. Nitin is going to be really angry. Answer is yes. Uh, so who's going to raise? Somebody raise your hand and answer. Somebody who's not answered before. You've answered before? No. Not answered. Please give him the mic. A is the right answer. What, sh what should it be instead of More that? than 80 and less uh, than 50 So years. everybody was very attentive. So we saw several hands up. So that's good for Dr. Nitin. So the answer here was actually what should have been written there was age more than 80 years and this was discussed at length. And so I'm not going to really discuss this anymore except to tell you uh, that these are, the, sorry, these are the ones in which you do your urodynamics and really we discussed this at length today. Okay. Uh, which takes us to the next question. With regard to post-prostatectomy incontinence, which one of the following statements is false? Duloxetine improves the continence rate. Bulking agents do not cure post prostatectomy incontinence. None of the bulking agents has been shown to be superior to one of the others. And duloxetine is, associ is associated with a rapid recovery. Don't answer while sitting, please. Use your hand, uh, uh, raise your hands, use the microphone, identify yourself. I'm Sai Vijay from Calicut Medical College. Go ahead. Answer is D. Duloxetine is associated with more rapid recovery. That is not a false statement. That's a true statement. Anybody else would like to try? So duloxetine is associated with a faster recovery of continence. Yeah, go ahead. Bulking agents do not cure. Uh, no, that's the right answer. Bulking agents do not cure. <laughs> okay. Don't tell me I'm going to take this prize also. Go ahead. I don't want to take a prize home. Tell me the right answer. A, a is the right answer. answer. So by, by A being the right answer means A is the wrong answer. So it's uh, duloxetine does not improve the continence rate. It just ensures that the continence happens earlier in time frame. So it does not improve the continence rate. And it also carries, we now know, significant uh, 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 complications in when you use it. So there's a European urology focused document uh, recently published. You should all be aware of that, of the risks of prescribing duloxetine. This is, it's still there in the guidelines. It's still there in the guidelines. It's there in the guidelines. Yeah, yeah, it's in the guidelines. Yeah. So all the, that's why I told the void warning too. So there is a warning in using, you have to be careful in using. So all the following are considered high risk neurogenic bladder patients for deterioration except spina bifida, multi-system atrophy, anorectal malformation and spinal cord injury. Okay, go ahead. I'll tell you the source document, just ask me. Hmm. Yeah. Anorectal malformation is not the right answer. Okay, somebody who's not answered. Sarika. Multi-system atrophy is the right answer. Please give her her chocolate and a big hand. So multi-system atrophy is, is definitely a situation where operating the patient carries a high risk of failure of your surgical procedure. But it's not a high risk condition in general for deterioration of the upper tracts. So if you look at the three conditions which are there in most guidelines as important, high risk neurogenic di bladder diagnosis for deterioration of the upper tracts, spinal cord injury, 
open spinal dysraphism, anorectal malformation. These three, and then there are certain parameters or tests like secondary reflux, upper tract dilatation, and so on, which are also markers. But these are the three diagnoses which, by virtue of just the diagnosis, you know that the patient is at high risk. And these three diagnoses, you don't need to wait for any symptom to decide for a urodynamics. In these three situations, upfront urodynamics in the evaluation of your patient is mandatory. And with the children especially, you need to get that urodynamics in as soon as possible. So there are children who come with open spinal dysraphism. You wait just for six months or one year and the child is already in renal insufficiency. So very important early assessment of these patients. Right? Okay, which statement regarding male LUTs is false? The diagnostic accuracy of, Dr. Nitin is again watching you guys. The diagnostic accuracy of PVR threshold of 50 ml has a positive as well as negative predictive value of about 50% for the prediction of bladder outlet obstruction. Serially increasing PVR can predict the development of acute retention in an individual patient. Specificity can be improved by repeated flow testing. The diagnostic accuracy of uroflowmetry in detecting bladder outlet obstruction is independent of the cutoff cut threshold. Don't, don't answer while sitting. Raise your arms, take the mic, and then answer. Sherlock. Yeah. Uh, you answered before. Did you get your chocolate? Yeah. You got your chocolate. Somebody else who's not answered? If not, then we'll give it to him. Okay, you can take the mic. Go ahead. Take the mic. A, sir. A is not the right answer. And Dr. Nitin is very angry with you. He better not be your examiner. So, just joking. You're sir, not D. With anybody. D is the right answer. So, we discussed at length this, not just Dr. Nitin. Professor Abrams also discussed that when he changed the threshold for what's, what you regard as your cutoff, whether it's 10 ml per second, whether it's 12 ml per second, whether it's 8 ml, as you're reducing that threshold, your specificity for a diagnosis of obstruction keeps on increasing. So, it does change. So it's not independent of the cutoff threshold. Uh, so, patients developing retention usually show increasing PVRs with time. So, if you mon monitor a patient's residual urine, you can in many instances predict his development of retention. The diagnostic accuracy of a PVR threshold of 50 ml is about 60 and 50 percent positive and negative predictive value. Uh, the specificity of uroflowmetry improves by reducing the cutoff threshold, 38 percent for 15 ml and 70 percent as Dr. Nathan in the morning emphasized for 10 ml per second uh, cutoff threshold. Uh, specificity also improved by uh, repeated testing. That's EAU guidelines 2019. Right. Which one of the following statements with regard to artificial sphincter for post prostatectomy incontinence is false? Artificial sphincter does not cure in stress incontinence in men. Long term failure rates for artificial sphincter is high. There is insufficient evidence to state whether one surgical approach for cuff placement is superior to another and the rate of explantation because of infection or erosion remains high. Which one of these four answers is, is, is false? Yeah, go ahead. The answer is C. There is insufficient evidence to say. Okay. Anybody else would like to try that? Yeah, go ahead. Answer is A. AUS does not cure SUI in men. It cures? Sure. It's yes. a treatment modality offer. Anybody else would like to try? He just said it. He's already tried it. No takers? I'm so sorry. <laughs> Maybe I missed that. What was that? Okay. What was it? Sorry, did I write a wrong question? Oh, I, I've mixed up the numbering. So the, the right answer is what I thought it was. The rate of explanation. Okay, right. Hold on. Did I get it wrong? It is effective. I think it's, sorry, I'm, I'm really sorry for this. I did this early in the morning. So rate of explant, let me go through the answer so we'll know whether I've written the answer wrong there. The rate of explantation because of infection erosion is high. It's about one quarter of patients. Mechanical failure is common. There's insufficient evidence for one uh, approach to be better than the other. Revision is possible after previous service. And primary implantation is effective for the cure. So we know it's effective for cure. The answer is actually B, not A. I think I've written it wrong. I'm so sorry. Just hold on. So long-term failure rate for AUS is not high. You need to, you need to uh, do revisions, but the long-term failure rate is, is, is about, uh, 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 long-term revision rate is about 24 or 26% at 10 years or something. So it, it is the most effective uh, procedure and remains the gold standard. Sorry for that. Uh, okay. Which so one the, of the, the answer was B. The answer is B. Which one of the following statements regarding nocturia is false? Nocturia is more prevalent in individuals with metabolic syndrome. Obstructive sleep apnea leads to suppression of atrial natriuretic peptide. Nocturia is a predictor of albuminuria. 
patients with nocturia are less likely to show an overnight fall in blood pressure. So the answer is B. 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 Yeah, the answer is B. The answer is B. Okay, give him a big hand. What is the right answer? Right, right. So, so natriuretic peptide causes natriuresis and sodium takes with it water and hence you need to have more of natriuresis to be able to get uh, uh, nocturia. So patients with obstructive sleep apnea show natriuresis due to an increased secretion of ANP. Nocturia is associated with metabolic syndrome, it's an independent mark of albuminuria and cardiovascular function is altered in these patients with the uh, absence of usual dip nocturnal blood pressure. Right. Which one statement regarding neurogenic blood is false? Use a single dose prophylaxis for a patient with long term catheter before you change the catheter. So, if a patient is on a long term catheter for some reason, use a single dose prophylaxis when you're changing. For a patient on CIC, prophylaxis is appropriate if the patient has had a recent infection. For a patient on CIC, prophylaxis is appropriate if the patient has had recurrent symptomatic UTIs when you're doing procedures for these patients. Let's say you're doing a urodynamic support or not. Recurrent UTI should be regarded as a red flag for patients with neurogenic bladder. This is a hand. Okay. Dr. Himanshu Sharma from, from Esther Mid City. Yeah. Uh, the answer is A. Yeah, A is the right answer. Please give a big hand. A is the right answer. You don't have evidence to support this, although we often do it, but you don't really have this evidence to support it. This is from the NICE guidelines of 2012. We also had a, a Cochrane review that we published. Uh, do not routinely use antibiotic prophylaxis for UTI and neurogenic bladder. Consider prophylaxis if they have a recent history of frequent or severe UTI. Recurrent UTI is a red flag. Other red flags I've already told you. Uh, you do not routinely offer prophylaxis unless they actually had sepsis before. Okay. Which one of the following statements, I think we have another maybe four or five questions. Uh, is uh, time wise we are okay, Dr. Chavla? Another 10 minutes or so? Yeah. Seven, eight minutes, sir? Huh? Okay, right, right. Sure, sure. So which one of the following statements with regard to autonomic dysreflexia in patients with neurogenic bladder is false? Flushing of the face is common. Patients typically have a lesion above T6. Tachycardia is common and loosening of the face can help. Somebody's not answered before. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, okay. Go ahead. So, C, tachycardia is found. That is the right answer. What do you get? You don't get tachycardia, you actually get bradycardia. So, you get a massive unopposed sympathetic response. These are lesions above the sympathetic outflow. And we've already discussed this yesterday for those of you who were there yesterday in my presentation yesterday. Uh, if you have elevated blood pressure, the first thing you teach your, your staff, your technician, your nurse, and so on, they must empty the bladder, remove the rectal catheter, and loosen the clothing. And meanwhile, you arrange for lifedipine if the patient's pressures have really gone up. You must monitor pressures who are, uh, in patients who have a lesion above T6. And the average resting blood pressure of a patient with a, with a quadriplegia can often be as low as 90 by 60. So even a 120-80 might actually represent uh, hypertension in a patient who's a, who has a high cervical condition. Okay, I think we'll end with this last question as Dr. Chavla said. Which statement regarding women with voiding LUTs is false? A woman with a maximum flow rate of more than 12 ml per second may be obstructed. A woman with a maximum flow rate of less than 12 and P dead Q max more than 25 is obstructed. Blevas nomogram has a high specificity for obstruction. And in a woman, uh, if, a woman does, if a woman does not void at UDS and attains a pressure of more than 20, she is obstructed. Which one of the following statements is not correct? Somebody has not answered before? Any hands still up? Okay. Give a mic there. Last one. <coughs> this carries a bigger price. Sir, answer is C. C is the right answer. Blevas nomogram does not have a high specificity. Very good. What's your name? Sir, Jadin Soni from Government Medical College, Trivandrum. Well done. That was, that was a difficult question to answer. Give him a big hand. Uh, C is the right answer. So especially remember, this, this, all these nomograms for the woman, they work very poorly, especially if you just apply them blindly. That means if you just take urodynamic data without the clinical details and you just apply the nomogram, you'll grossly overdiagnose obstruction. So you need to apply them specifically to women who have presented with voiding difficulty. And in those situations also, in fact, the Blavas nomogram does not have a high uh, specificity. I will end at this. Thank you very much for participating in the quiz um, and hope you have a great evening. Bye.